We've been in the book of 1 Thessalonians now for uh, perhaps two months even, I think. So, if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me there as we uh, look this morning once more to the writings of Paul to the church of the Thessalonians. It is important for us to realize that in this first chapter of First Thessalonians, Paul is repeatedly dealing with the subject of genuine salvation. I found a very interesting article. Some of you know that there's a Christian counseling center in Lafayette, Indiana, a biblical counseling training center. In a newsletter they sent out just a couple of years ago, I'd like to read a statement which I think is quite surprising, and uh, I think you will find the information quite surprising as well. Counselors across the U.S. say that 75% of those coming for counseling, 75% think they are Christians but have never been converted. Three out of four people coming for counseling. He goes on to say, I think it is because of a weak gospel-centered, gospel, pardon me, a weak gospel, centered on how God can eliminate your hassles and make you happy, rather than how he has provided a savior from sin and judgment. Many in evangelical churches have heard the pitch for an abundant life and prayed to Jesus, but were never convicted of their sin, have never truly repented, and never truly trusted Jesus Christ. For a church to make an impact, the congregation must be made of individuals transformed by the power of God through the gospel. The biggest problem we have in America is people who said the prayer, fulfilled the series of steps, but never had a saving encounter with Jesus Christ. I can pray, I can say, I can even do so many things, but until God does a work in me, my life has never been transformed by the saving grace of God. Our text for this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we'll begin reading at verse number 6. If you do not have a Bible, it is on the screen behind me. Writing to the Thessalonians, Paul says this, And you became followers of us, and of the Lord, having received the word in much joy, uh, pardon me, in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. I think I have skipped a verse. No, I didn't. Okay, thank you. Notice, if you will, please, in verse 6, the word followers. The word that is translated followers from the original language is the word imitators. When the gospel was preached to the Thessalonians, as in any new mission field, there were an immediate series of decisions made for Jesus Christ. But for the message to go beyond those initially who came to Christ, it was essential and it was the God-designed plan that those in the church of the Thessalonians were affected by the message of the gospel so that their lives actually became a glittering example of the power of God in saving men and women. We are living in a day when the Western world, 
and the American church make much of a formula of salvation, but very little of the transforming grace of Almighty God. We have people who claim to know Jesus Christ who have no interest in serving Christ. They claim to have come under the authority of the Scripture, and they have no interest in what the Bible has to say. In fact, it's really an interruption, if not an irritation, to their very important life. And the tragedy is that God knew that the world needed to see the gospel of Christ in shoe leather. The cynics, the critics, the Christ rejectors, those who are too educated to come to Christ and those who are too enwrapped in their sins needed to see the power of the grace of God to transform lives. And Paul begins by telling us that the intention of God was that the church hold forth the word of life by the very power of God in the lives of the people. Clovis Chapel was a Methodist pastor at the time of World War II. Clovis Chapel tells the story. He says there were two paddle boats traveling down the Mississippi River going from Memphis to New Orleans. As they sailed side by side, sailors on one ship made remarks of how they saw the slow progress of the other ship. Soon, challenges were ushered across the water and a race began. The competition was fierce as the ships roared south on the Mississippi. One boat began falling behind and ran out of fuel. They had plenty of coal for the trip, but they had not planned to have enough for a race. As the one boat dropped back, an enterprising sailor thought and grabbed some of the ship's cargo to use as fuel. When the other ship sailors saw that the supplies being burned included not only the coal, but also included the cargo, they began to fuel their boat with material to transport to New Orleans. They ended up winning the race, but burning their entire cargo. We have focused so much on church institution, church growth, church success, that I'm afraid one of the great tragedies today is the church may win the race, but may lose the cargo. First Timothy 6, if I may say it this way, illustrates the cargo. Paul writing to young Timothy, who is pastoring at Ephesus, just a short distance away, he says, O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. The most precious thing the church has is not our attendance, it is not our membership, it is not our offerings, it is not our financial stability, it is not our staff. The most precious thing the church of Jesus Christ has is the Word of God. And the tragedy is that we are trading in America truth for success. We are in a culture that everything must be bigger to be better. I have news for you. Bigger is not always better. Just for a simple illustration, I walk up and I bang my head on the wall and it swells and gets bigger. I don't have any more in it 
after it's bigger than I had before it got bigger. And the church of Jesus Christ is making a tragic mistake in the Western world. These statistics are not mine, but they are from Church Growth Institute. 53% of all Americans are now churchgoers in a church of an attendance of over 500. There are many motivations, they tell us, in this trend. For some, it is to retreat to the comfort zone and simply chill out in the crowd. For others, it is to hide anonymity and avoid responsibility. And for still others, the grass is always greener and it's the quest for more or for better. Programs, music, opportunities. Let me remind you that the obsession to have the big, better, best may actually reflect emotional immaturity as well as spiritual immaturity. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he said, I intended to write to you, but I could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Immature people must have a crowd in order to feel comfortable about themselves. But a spiritual person recognizes that the work of God is always individual, one at a time, singular. Even on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 souls were saved, they were not saved in mass. They were personally, privately, individually saved by Jesus Christ. And as you come to the church of the Thessalonians, the concern of the apostle is that those who are in the church recognize that the great concern in the scripture is that they become, verse 6, imitators of Jesus Christ. My wife and I, because I'm a pastor, have moved periodically in our lifetime. And quite often we have found ourselves on the internet looking for homes. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have walked into a house and my mind said to me as I walked in, looking at this, this place does not look like the pictures. The pictures were actually a very poor copy of the real. Jesus Christ intended that you and I become imitators, or translated in our English Bible here, we become followers of Jesus Christ. I had a good friend who was in his 70s at the time. I was in my 40s, and I rode with him for years on the trails in Florida riding our bikes, sometimes 40 miles in a day. I'll never forget, he talked about someone he led to Christ, and then he made this statement, which took me by surprise, coming from a layman. He said, no one is a real parent who brings a baby into the world and then abandons it. And what we have in America is an assembly line approach to reaching people that simply feeds them in, feeds them through, and throws them out and moves on to the next. And brings them in and feeds them through and throws them out because they are not the end. They are the means to an end. And the church of Jesus Christ is suffering because we have forgotten the Great Commission and what we were actually called to do. Some of us read the word to be an imitator, and in our mind, being an imitator means we pretend to be like the real. Or maybe for some of us, it's kind of the monkey see, monkey do, and we simply echo what we have seen. The amazing thing is that the word used in our passage does not mean imitate in the sense of outwardly practice what is going on. 
The word that is used here is the word mimetes. You get the English word mime from it, or mimic from it, or pantomime, or mimeograph. But the word does not mean outwardly copy. It really means to inwardly copy. When you read in the Bible of the disciples of Jesus Christ, they were called Christians, the disciples were, because the term meant to those who used it, they so reflected Jesus Christ that when you saw them, you were seeing an exact duplicate a mirror image, a perfect reflection of the Son of God. That's what being transformed is all about, and that's something only God can do, and only does it by His marvelous grace. But it was the design of God in saving us to not just forgive our sins, but to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. How many of you read the Our Daily Bread. Would you raise your hand, even if you don't read it regularly? The next time you see this name, take note of it. The name is Henrietta Mears. She will periodically occur in Our Daily Bread. Henrietta Mears is the, or was, the Director of Christian Education at Hollywood Presbyterian. Hollywood Presbyterian was President Reagan's church, some of you know the name of Lloyd John Ogilvy. Henrietta Mears is famous for three men whose lives she touched in that position. Hollywood Presbyterian sponsored a conference center in Southern California known as, uh, give me a moment to find it where I have it, the Forest Home Christian Conference Center. Three men came under her influence, and all three of them were greatly influenced from that point on for the future of their lives. The first one is the name Munger. If you go to the church office and look on the counter, you will see a little booklet. That little booklet written by Pastor Munger, Presbyterian preacher, is entitled, My Heart, Christ Home. That little booklet became famous because the navigators used it all over the world to remind people that Christ is to live in every believer. Henrietta Mears affected Munger. The second name you may know a little bit better. It's a man by the name of Bill Bright. Bill Bright came under her influence, and Bill Bright will go on to become the executive director of Campus Crusade for Christ. The third man was an evangelist who came to Southern California. When he came to Southern California, he had a, an evangelistic set of meetings. And while he was there, he needed to spend some time with God. He was the president of a Bible college. And so what happened was Henrietta invited him to come to the Forest Home Conference Center and Billy Graham spent days on his knees in prayer and went back after that meeting and he resigned from Northwestern College and entered the field of evangelism and the rest has become history. Now, you may not appreciate it, but God intended that every believer's life never be a cul-de-sac, never be a dead-end street, Far too many people think God saves us to listen to sermons. That is a lie. God saves us to be a channel to other people. And if you are not fulfilling that purpose, you have not achieved God's design in saving men and women. Take your Bible for a moment and turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says to them 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, notice, if you will, please, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse number 16, please. 1 Corinthians 4, 16, the Bible says this, Therefore, I urge you, notice his request. Imitate me. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for a moment. First Corinthians 11, Paul says to them a second time, First Corinthians 11 and verse number 1, the Apostle Paul says, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. It was God's design that I as a believer am leading the quality of life that God designed for the believer so that I can say to every convert, you can look to me and you can do as I do. Many of us can remember parents making this statement, do as I say, not as I do. The biggest hindrance to godly living is poor example. There have been times in my life that I would like for my convert to not have to go to the church. You say, why? Because honestly, I am quite ashamed quite often of the quality of where we are as believers from what God designed the church to be. I've seen carnality in the church that made believers look like they were unsaved people. I have seen attitudes in people who said they were Christians I have not even seen in the general public. I have seen fights between people who say they love the Lord that I never saw between unchurched people. And one of the biggest hindrances to the cause of Jesus Christ is the stumbling block of people who claim they are believers, but they don't look very transformed. Turn back, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And look again at verse number 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice, if you will, please, verse number 6. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. You see, the problem is, think this through. The Thessalonians had never seen Jesus. The only illustration of Jesus Christ in flesh they could see is from those who came to represent him. They became the reflection, the mirror, the perfect duplicate that that unsaved person was looking for to see the reality of who Jesus Christ is. In other words, if I pick the Bible up, I think the concern of Scripture is not arithmetic in the church, but authenticity. And the church of Jesus Christ suffers tragically from the lack of genuine reality when it comes to godliness in our attitudes, godliness in our motivations, godliness in our priorities, godliness in our time, godliness in our lifestyle, godliness in our disciplines, godliness in our commitment to the cause of Jesus Christ. We suffer because far too many people do not want to step up to the plate and fulfill God's design. Hold your place here in 1 Thessalonians and turn back with me, if you will, please, to Matthew 28. And let me point something out to you that is often neglected. First, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 28. Hmm. 
Notice, if you will, please, in Matthew chapter 28, I'm going to purposely misread the verse. I often do this, and you know that I do it. I do it because I want us to see what we think is not what the text says. So look at the text. Go therefore and make decisions for Christ's, Christ of all nations. The text does not say make decisions. We only have one commission, and the commission is to make disciples. That is the great commission. Make disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them the Romans road. Pardon me. Verse 20, teaching them the Romans road or the John road or any other road, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. God's intention was to take the number of people that God brings into our life and raise the level of where those people are living. Take them to fulfill the divine design so that they ultimately reflect what God intended the church to reflect. John Stott, there are some things he says I don't agree with, but listen to this. I think I agree with his words wholeheartedly. He said, no congregation can spread the gospel with any degree of integrity, let alone credibility, unless those within are visibly changed by the gospel the church preaches. We need to look a lot more like what we're talking about if we're going to reach anyone else. We must embody the faith, the love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, the hope, and the righteousness God intended to be reflected in His church. I find it interesting that the people who were in the Thessalonian church radically had changed from what they were to what they now are. Look down, if you will, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and notice, if you will, verse 9. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 9, the Bible says concerning the people of Greece, for they themselves declare concerning us. The Grecians are already talking about Christianity because of you. Listen to what he says. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You turn from idolatry to Jesus Christ. You turn from superstition to the Holy Spirit. You turn from an immoral lifestyle to a godly lifestyle. It is a radical transformation that suddenly becomes, becomes the tool the Spirit of God uses to get the attention of the public. Guy Peters, writing for Bibsac, which is the Dallas Theological Seminary periodical, wrote the following, and part of the quote is on the screen, the main emphasis. He said, a disciple is more than a believer. A disciple is more than a learner, at least in the ordinary sense. A disciple is more than a follower of Jesus Christ. A disciple is more than a holy enthusiast. A disciple is even more than living a life of devotion. A disciple is a believer living in conscious and constant identification with his Lord so that his words, behavior, attitudes, and motives continuously reflect 
what the Bible describes as the character of God. He is living as he fully realizes under absolute ownership to Jesus Christ. He joyfully embraces serving Christ. He delights in the lordship of Christ. He enjoys living by abiding in the indwelling purposes, pardon me, resources for his purpose that God has given. The call to discipleship always involves undisputed obedience, ready submission, genuine faith, arduous labor, unselfish service, self-renunciation, patient suffering, painful sacrifice, and cross-bearing. And the tragedy is that the church would rather preach evangelism than discipleship. When I graduated from high school, the high school began to do what so many schools were doing around the country. Rather than seeking the best, they lowered the average. And once they lowered to an average grade where everybody was on equal footing, guess what the student body did? Took one step back. And so the average got lowered. And they took one step back, and the average got lowered. I submit to you the problem in the church in America today is that we have taken the biblical standard that God set, and we have gone for an average instead of an ideal. And the cause of Jesus Christ is suffering. Because we don't expect people to strive to be, strive to do, strive to live as God intended them to. We don't want passion. That's wildfire. We simply want people who are pretty good people in the community, but not necessarily known to be sold out to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. When I was a student at Tennessee Temple, I can tell you right now, I had more influence on my life by Highland Park Baptist Church than I did by my professors. Oh, they taught me the facts, but they didn't put fire in my soul. What put fire in my soul was the members of a Highland Park Baptist Church who worked in grocery stores and car uh, salesmen and worked in businesses throughout the community. And I would encounter them on the street and encounter them in the mall. And I discovered people who were on fire for God and that was an influence on my life. The problem in America today is that is gone. We have made Christianity a private thing except for a public service. And the influence that the church was supposed to have is lost, except when we decide to get involved politically. I'm ashamed. We get more excited about politics than we do about wickedness. We are more concerned about this than we are about this. Because this is going to require more of us. We just want them to come up to our level. We're not interested in striving to reach God's level. And God intended that the church and Christians reflect Jesus Christ. The name of God is defamed by us. The American church is the cause of what's going on. I can tell you right now, abortion wouldn't be a problem homosexuality wouldn't be a problem if we had not for 50 years been on retreat. We have basically exited from what God called us to do and we're expecting them to rise up to where we are which is nothing more than a state of personal contentment not a state of on fire for God. You say, I don't like the way you're preaching. How about this? God doesn't like the way you're living. He doesn't. You will not find what we call cultural Christianity in the Bible. It doesn't exist. And the cause of America's problems is we have far too many people who are leaders in the church, officers in the church, members of the church, long standing in the church, but not sold out to Jesus Christ. And it's a shame for the name of Jesus Christ. We will not turn the world around until you and I are turned around. 
We need revival if we want evangelism to take place. I am so weary of the American church with our hypocrisy, our self-satisfaction. Go to this level, but don't push me to go beyond that. Well, I'm going to tell you something. As long as I pastor Granville Bible, I'm here to tell you I am going to push you. I'm not going to accept what's going on. I absolutely don't care who gets angry, and I don't care who gets mad and says I'm leaving. I'll strive for God's ideal. Turn to Matthew 28 again. You say, you're nothing but an old cantankerous preacher. No, I'm an old-fashioned Bible-believing preacher, and we are scarce in number today. Preachers don't have a backbone. They've got a jelly roll. They're more concerned about popularity than they are about pleasing Jesus Christ. And the church of Jesus Christ is suffering. It is suffering because of the fact that we are anemic spiritually and unwilling to admit that we are the problem God calls us. Matthew 28, turn with me there. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of things this morning. Go ye, verse 19. Literally, it reads in the original, as you're going. The implication is, in your natural carrying on and conducting of your life, make disciples. The word disciple is actually the same root word from which we get our word discipline. And people who want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ are willing to have disciplines put on them in order to stretch them or take them to the next level. They are not satisfied with the status quo. They are dissatisfied. And they are striving to go to a higher level. Notice in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. I want to make a statement, and I want you to catch this. The Bible is not only our message book. It is also our method book. The reason the church is in the condition it's in is because for years, all that mattered was numbers, 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 decisions, professions, baptisms, attendance. We were driven by those things. And Jesus Christ cared more about quality than he did about quantity. Consider this. When Jesus Christ left this world, there were only 120 disciples. He had less than we have right here. And the entire world was radically transformed. Let me ask you this question. Do you think it was transformed by people like you? Think that through. What if the entire world rested on the quality of what we give to Jesus Christ? That's why I say to you, the church in America is sick. And rather than looking for a better number, better method, why not choose to become better people? Bill Ho, very famous man from, I believe, from uh, Colorado. He's written a number of books on discipleship. In his book, Christ the Disciple Maker, he says this, and I quote, I am weary of the term disciple. A grand biblical principle has been absolutely distorted. We have turned it into a mechanical assembly line process. High speed, short term, results oriented. You don't drop people into a class and they come out disciples. 
I'm tired of watching human rodeos, people herded into a corral, dehorned, branded, and then turned out to pasture. What was God's design? Without the aid of Sunday school, or vacation Bible school, or the Christian school, uh, without the support of Scripture press or the local press, without the help of a denomination or a clearinghouse, the church of the Thessalonians reached the entire nation of Greece so that they became a conversation piece across the whole country. Something went on in them, therefore something went on from them. Think about this for a moment. Barnabas comes to Christ in Acts chapter 2. By Acts chapter number 9, he's committed to the cause of Jesus Christ, and his best friend comes to Christ, Paul. In Acts chapter number 11, Barnabas takes Paul and says, I want you to join me on a missionary journey. Now we have a disciple who has now got his own spiritual son in the ministry who now is involved in ministry. And the Apostle Paul begins his famous missionary journeys. And he, in Acts chapter 16, influences a young man named Timothy. That's a grandson. And he influences this man, Titus, that we just finished. And Barnabas' life results in a great-grandson and a great-grandson involved in the ministry. Question, who's serving Jesus Christ because of you? I didn't say who prayed the sinner's prayer. Who is sold out to Jesus Christ because of you? So is that going to be your end result? Paul could write to the same church, and I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and notice, if you will, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Listen carefully in verse 19 of chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. The Apostle Paul. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you? In the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. That's all that mattered. I'm making a difference. I'm touching lives. I close with this illustration. It all started with a Sunday school teacher. Mr. Edward Kimball, in 1858, walked into a Boston shoe store and there was a clerk who had been attending his Sunday school. With a burden for him, Mr. Edward Kimball led a young clerk to Jesus Christ. That young clerk, Dwight L. Moody, became an evangelist. And in 1879, he went to Europe to proclaim his message. And while he was there in England, he was asked to preach at a small church outside of London. The pastor of the church had a doctor's degree, and here was D.L. Moody preaching with a fifth-grade education. That pastor was Frederick Brotherton Meyer, F.B. Meyer, influenced by D.L. Moody, influenced by Edward Kimball. Eventually, F.B. Meyer came to the United States of America at the invitation of Moody and preached at Northfield, Massachusetts. And then on a college campus just outside of Boston, a young man heard him. He said, F.B. Meyer said, if you're not willing to give up everything for Jesus Christ, are you willing to be made willing? And a young man responded by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman. J. Wilbur Chapman joined the YMCA ministry, started by D.L. Moody, and entered evangelism. And while he was preaching, a former baseball player by the name of Billy Sunday came to listen to him. And Billy Sunday trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and then joined 
J. Wilbur Chapman in his evangelism ministry and watched and learned to preach and took over Chapman's ministry. Billy Sunday traveled to Charlotte, North Carolina, where he was preaching in a meeting, and a young man listened to him preach, and Mordecai Ham trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And Mordecai Ham, during his revival ministry, had 33,000 decisions made for Jesus Christ. In 1932, a local farmer loaded up his pickup with teenagers for the meetings that Ham was having in Charlotte. Among them was a 16-year-old boy who sat spellbound night by night and finally turned to Jesus Christ. And Billy Graham became a believer. It all started with a Sunday school teacher. Who are you influencing for Jesus Christ? Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, there is no good done by simply stirring up wrath and reaction in people. By the same token, there were times that people left Jesus Christ angry because they knew they were hearing the truth and far from it. May the Spirit of God stir us to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to the gospel that saves men and women, to proclamation of the Word of God and a life of yieldedness to the Holy Spirit because, Father, those are the great need of our day. And it's not a numbers game. It's not a business. It's not the Western model. It's simply a life that is so filled with Jesus Christ that others are attracted to that life also. Forgive the Western church. Forgive us. Forgive me for settling for something far inferior to what you design. And call us, Father, to a far higher level. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.